No matter how good you are at the violin or how long you've been playing, one of the things that you're going to think about and work on more than almost anything else is intonation. And it's a thing that we don't understand a lot of times as well as we should. And maybe if we understood it more from a scientific standpoint, we would be able to play a little bit better because we can use some of these sort of tips and tricks from learning about the science to inform some of the exercises that we do and uh, to help us play better because that's the goal of all these things, right? To play better. There are 12 notes in every octave. Let's just start with some basic stuff here. C, C sharp, D, D sharp, or E flat, whatever. So I'm not going to go through them all, but you know there's 12 notes per octave. How do we actually end up here? How did we, and this is, I'm talking Western European influenced music, by the way. Indian classical music uses a completely different scale, and you'll understand why after we get a little deeper into this. But how did we decide in Western classical music that we're going to have 12 notes in every octave? Well, there are some fundamental relationships between frequencies of notes. And we hear an octave, you get an A and an A, you go, oh, th those are different notes, but they're the same note. Why is that? Well, there's a two to one relationship in the frequency between your open A on your violin at 440 hertz, and then third finger on the E string, which is 880 hertz. And you can see on the little graph here that we've got, one is, we'll say that that's 440 and the other one's 880. And you can see how many times those nodes intersect at the, uh, at the axis there, your ear can hear that. And it's a very comforting and very stable and very familiar sound once you hear it. So open A being 440, third finger on the E string being 880. We know first finger on the G string will be half of 440, so that's 220. So 220, 440, 880. When those notes are played together, it's very stable and very familiar. It's a, it's a very recognizable sound. There's one more of those relationships that's very, very mathematical, and your ear can hear it, and it wants to hear that sound, and that's the three to two relationship, it's the fifth. So like your open D string and your open A string are a fifth apart from each other, that's a three to two relationship in frequency, and you can see on this graph that, again, there's a bunch of times where these nodes intersect, and your ears really, really like that sound. So if we take this circle of fifths, say we start on C and we go up a fifth to G, up a fifth to D, up a fifth to A, up a fifth to E, up a fifth to B, and we just keep going 12 times, we end up back on C. We end up right back where we started, kind of. So we use our ears to gauge whether we're in tune or not, right? That's, that's how you're practicing. You practice and you listen, you go, oh, that note's out of tune, that note's in tune. We use our ears and on a fretless instrument, then we can sort of move our fingers and nudge those notes around on our fingerboard until they sound right. And say, well, well, gosh, what frequency would that C sharp be when I'm playing that? I can just use a tuner and I can say well, that that's gonna be exactly in tune. It turns out it's not quite that easy. Where those exact frequencies are outside of our reference frequencies, uh, they actually move. So let's, let's hear a little demo here. When we talk about sounding right, we're gonna use our ears to listen to what these intervals sound like when they're played together. We're listening to this fifth. And now it sounds like it's in tune, right? So we'll do the same thing with a major third. adjust that until it sounds in tune. Let's try it with a minor third. You can hear where it sounds like it's in tune, but if we put a tuner on those, they're not exactly right. And that's the problem. When we go to tune a piano, the first time we said, okay, we got a harpsichord or a clavier or a piano here. I've got A, I've got the next A, I've got 440 and 880. Where am I going to put those notes in the middle? And if I try to use my ear to tune all those intervals in the middle, I'm actually going to end up in a mess. It's not going to work. Um, that's, so they've decided what they will do is we've got 12 notes. We're just going to divide those frequencies up evenly, and we're going to space them out so that they are equally distant. It's called equal temperament 
versus just temperament, which is what your ears want to hear. Bach actually wrote a piece called The Well-Tempered Clavier in Clavier or whatever. I'm from North Carolina. Um, Well-Tempered Pianer. So he wrote a piece for that because this instrument, this tuning system for this instrument was relatively new. And it's actually, it's out, it's equally out of tune in every key. That's a piano is equally out of tune in every key. So I've got some graphs here that I can show you to help you visualize. Each person visualizes things a little bit different. So maybe one of these is going to help you more than the others. If we look at the equal temperament, the way they tune a piano in order to make all the math work out so it can play in more than one key and actually sound roughly in tune in those keys, equal temperament versus just intonation. The pink bars show you how out of tune the piano is versus what your ears actually want to hear. And it turns out that that minor third and the, the major sixth, same, uh, same interval, that was like really out of tune on a piano. And the tritone also really out of tune on a piano. And it turns out, look at this perfect fifth. It's actually just a hair out of tune. If you play a C and a G on a piano, they don't sound quite as juicy as they sound on a violin when you tune it exactly right to your ear. So here's another, uh, here's another visualization. You can see that just intonation, which is what your ear wants to hear, that's on top. And then the well-tempered is on the bottom. And you can see how far apart some of these are. You can see that the, the, um, the intervals or the space between some of these intervals, like between re and re, that's a big space. So when you're practicing your scales, you're not actually going in equal temperament. It's not the same distance between your fingers in any given key when you're playing. So those notes are actually moving around. C sharp is not always a certain frequency and it'll be different from key to key, right? So it depends on if it's do or if it's me or if it's la, it will move pretty significantly in that key. And this is, uh, this is the, uh, the chart for, the, for the, the Excel spreadsheet for the nerds out there. Um, showing the difference between the, the just scale, which is what your ear wants to hear, and then the equal temperament scale, which is how we have to line up our pianos so that they actually work, okay? So all this is, is interesting and it's exciting and it's nerdy and it's fun, but it's, how, how do we actually use this? Well, it turns out perfect fifths are not actually perfect, right? If we do our circle of fifths all the way around the 12 fifths, that covers seven octaves, but not quite exactly seven octaves. Remember this perfect fifth, we talk about the three to two relationship or 1.5. The, the just the equal temperament fifth is 1.498. And that sounds like it's pretty close, but when you stack those tolerances over some space, we end up with a, what they call the Pythagorean comma which is at the end of this whole thing, after seven octaves, we actually have about a quarter of a half step discrepancy between where C was and then seven octaves later. This, the next C is actually gonna be kind of out of tune, like kind of significantly out of tune. What does this mean for practical applications? Well, there's a reason in orchestras that we tune with an A for the violins instead of E. If we tuned with E, as that fifth grows, your A is actually going to be a little bit flat. D is going to be even a little bit more flat. G is going to be even a little bit more flat. So if you have three stack ups on the violin, your G string is going to be, well, it's kind of significantly flat. So they tune the A because it's kind of in the middle of the fingerboard. And that way G is technically going to be a little flat, but less than it would have been if we'd been tuning off of an open E. So that's kind of cool. Uh, extended range violins, especially if I tune to an E on my seven string violin, and then I use my ear to adjust A, D, G, C, F, B flat, my B flat is going to be like really flat, like significantly flat. And it's going to have some implications for me trying to play in tune with myself and with other people in an ensemble. So when you're using an extended range violin, uh, it's probably best to use a tuner and tune it so that those fifths are actually not quite perfect. Um, so when you're playing with pianos or you're playing with fretted instruments, 
uh, it's pretty important to be aware of some of these tuning discrepancies, fretted violins especially. This is one of the reasons why we tell people that the frets on a fretted violin are not magic. You can't just use a tuner to exactly determine where your bridge is going to be on, an, on a Viper or something with an adjustable bridge on it. You've got to, you got to understand that the perfect relationships that your ear wants to hear are different from what your tuner is going to hear. And then equal temperament is different from just temperament, which is why the frets on a fretted violin, you can actually slide over them. They're really more like landmarks than hard and fast um, intonation makers. Does that make sense? So when you're using a tuner to check your intonation, be aware that it is not going to sound in tune depending on uh, depending on the interval. Some like your major and minor thirds, those are actually going to sound significantly out of tune if you're using a tuner to determine how you're doing this. So one of the things that we can do if we want to train our ears to use just intonation, because that's generally what people are going to hear. They're going to hear just intonation and you can't use equal temperament and just they're different. So you can't use your tuner to train yourself to play because you're going to be training yourself to play in equal temperament. What your ears want to hear is just temperament. So one of the things we can use is to use distortion to help us understand how uh, intonation works and how to make us better players. Uh, now, distortion does hide errors in articulation. So distortion can kind of hide some of your mistakes when you're practicing your articulation exercises. I wouldn't use distortion for those. But if I'm practicing for intonation, I would use distortion, and I'm going to show you why. Remember before we were listening to the violin to hear if certain intervals sounded in tune. It can be a little hard with a clean tone because you don't have a lot of interference between those notes where the frequencies are clashing. But if you add distortion, it actually gets a lot easier. Let's listen to a fifth. And now a major third. Here it's coming in. It's way more obvious that that note is now in tune. Distortion actually adds more high frequency artifacts to those sounds and it makes the collisions between the out of tune notes a lot more obvious. So they jump out at you like a lot. Practicing your intonation with distortion reveals a lot of things that you wouldn't hear with a clean tone. So now you know more about intonation than you knew before. Maybe it's more intimidating than it was, I don't know, but at least you've got some more background information on how this whole tuning and intonation and playing in tune, what does it mean? What's the math behind it? Now you know, so go practice. Go practice your scales and your etudes and your intonation. So uh, as always, please follow us on uh, YouTube here and subscribe and uh, yeah, check out the other videos and uh, after, after you go practice and then watch some more videos.